All right guys, before I even attempt to say this name, I want you to know I've practiced for hours and can source multiple sources, including Google, who say it like this, Quetzalcoatlus. Hopefully that hits the nail on the head, and please let me know your thoughts on my attempt at pronunciation down below. For now, we need to talk about what society and life in general would be like if we still had 32 to 36 foot wide reptiles weighing around 500 pounds flying around our skies. And to no surprise, yes, they are one of the biggest known flying animals of all time, because what creature 30 plus feet in size weighing a quarter of a ton can take flight? Apparently this one. Now I will say there isn't really much information on these things, and there is still a fair amount of debate regarding important factors, such as if these things could even take flight, or would just glide around after jumping from a peak. Either way, today on Life's Biggest Questions, we're asking what if the Quetzalcoatlus didn't go extinct? What's going on guys? Welcome back to LBQ. I'm your host for this one, Jared Bronstein, and today we're talking about the Quetzalcoatlus. As always, be sure to let us know what other videos or questions you'd like to see on our channel in the comments down below. And speaking about comments, stick around until the very end for some comment replies. For now, let's get right into this one. Now just to clarify, the Quetzalcoatlus is believed to have a wingspan ranging from 32 to 36 feet, and is estimated to be about the height of a giraffe while standing, coming in around 18 feet tall. Still, this would be a pretty big reptile flying around our skies. And although they are still a fairly new discovery, with the earliest fossil dating back to as recent as 1971, belonging to the Azhedarchid group of pterosauruses, which is usually and incorrectly referred to as pterodactyls, these things were believed to exist around 77 million years ago. In regards to physicality, they had long beaks, similar to a modern day stork. However, they had long necks as well, like a giraffe, which seems to have made up a large majority of their height. They would stand on all fours as well, which is odd, but their wings were almost extensions of their hands. In a sense, they almost use their fingers to fly. It sounds insane, and that's because it is, but we're also talking about the world's largest flying animal. These things were believed to exist around 66 million years ago. In regards to physicality, they had long beaks similar to a modern day stork. However, they had long necks as well, like a giraffe, which seems to have made up a large majority of their height. They would stand on all fours as well, which is odd, but their wings were almost an extension of their hands. In a sense, they almost used their fingers to fly. It sounds insane, and that's because it is, but we're also talking about the world's largest flying animal, which existed 66 million years ago, so maybe this isn't so far-fetched. In regards to diet, well, this is up for debate. Truthfully, a lot of the information I'm going to cover in this video is up for debate, as there seems to be more information coming out about this thing as the years go on. Like anything in science or history, it's possible we learn more as we discuss more about the past. So it's quite possible some of the information in this video will actually be outdated five years down the road, when they possibly learn that Quetzalcoatlus never even went extinct at all. Likely not going to happen, but who knows. Either way, let's continue. Regarding diet, well, this is another big old question mark. Originally, researchers believed they would fly over water and use their long beaks to feed on fish and crustaceans, but it wouldn't be long before researchers would come to the understanding that where the fossils of these things were found, there weren't any large bodies of water nearby. Specifically, in 1975, Douglas A. Lawson, who actually discovered the fossil in the first place, rejected the idea that these things ate fish. He believes these things would fly around scavenging for carcasses and possibly even feeding on baby dinos. It's believed they lived mostly in land, again due to the fact that their fossils were found nowhere near water while they were still roaming the skies. In 1996, this hypothesis was rejected, and researchers would believe that these things would fly closer to the water, skimming it for fish that it would catch in waves. Although this was widely accepted for years, in 2008, it was determined the dragging method they would use to capture the fish was highly unlikely. Pointing out the reptile's physicality, specifically referencing their necks, beaks, and jaw, it was determined these things were likely inland creatures who did feed on smaller animals, leading many to believe they were carnivorous. In regards to flight, well, surprise surprise, there's tons of debate here as well. Some don't think they were capable of flight at all, while others think they would push off all fours and take off. Then you have the party that believes they could simply jump off of high peaks and use that momentum to glide for hours and possibly days at a time. Of course, depending on which one of these hypotheses are true, would certainly change the outcome of our video. If they couldn't fly, there's the possibility we find ways to combat that should one ever come into the city. But if they were able to take off at any given moment, that's a totally different story. Mike Habib, a specialist in biomechanics from Chatham University, described the Quetzalcoatlus as, I quote, a very bizarre animal to see fly above you or walk on the ground. It would look like a strange amalgamation of a classic modern reptile, bird, giraffe, and bat all squeezed into one. And speaking on flight, both he and Mark Witten, a paleontologist, believe these things had the ability to fly up to 80 miles an hour for a total of 7 to 10 days, as high as 15,000 feet. However, he explained that doesn't mean they necessarily did. 
Doesn't mean necessarily a specific number, just that it would be long enough to say, cross an ocean. Although some agreed they can fly, they disagreed with the distance in which they could go. It seems the most widely agreed upon stance is that these things were able to fly long distances, fed on baby dinos, and although how they got in the air is still a big question mark, either by jumping off of elevated areas or using their own strength, while in flight they were able to increase their speed and altitude. So with all this in mind, what happens if they never went extinct? Well, we could be in some big trouble, but it seems only in remote areas. Odds are these things wouldn't fly around the city the way pigeons do because there would just be way too much going on. The noise, the people, the large buildings, it's just all so unnatural that these things likely wouldn't want any part of it. Although their fossils were found around Texas, as we know the world was and is a much different place than it was 66 plus million years ago. So to say that if these things existed they would fly all over Texas would also be incorrect. It's likely that if they did still exist, these things would probably live in the mountains. But given the little amount of information we truly know about these things, it really is hard to say for sure. When speaking of any kind of prehistoric creature, it's also important to keep in mind, they would need to adapt to our way of living, not the other way around. Example being, if for whatever reason these things tried to feed on humans, assuming we would use enough firepower to kill one, two, or however many came close enough that we were to feel threatened, eventually they would just stop attacking us. Now I'm not so sure they'd even try to feed on humans in the first place, although it is evident they would prey on smaller creatures such as baby dinosaurs. A baby dinosaur is still bigger than a human. I mean not necessarily, but odds are. With that being said, it's likely that these things wouldn't necessarily be the same size that many believed they were all those years ago. Again, back then it was a different environment, more oxygen on the earth, different temperatures, and even landscape. But the question at hand is, what if they didn't go extinct? This would mean that they did in fact find a way to adapt and they're currently living among us, we just don't know it yet. And if that's the case, well then our lives likely wouldn't change all that much, at least in regards to the average person's day to day life. For those actually studying this thing, and really anyone who has studied prehistoric animals in the past, this would be a complete game changer. What other extinct creatures are out there that never actually went extinct? And how did these guys manage to survive the ice age? As you can see, the reality of these things never going extinct opens a whole can of worms I feel people really wouldn't want to dive into. Or maybe they would, I mean, it is an interesting idea to think about. Regardless, one thing is for sure, if these guys never went extinct, maybe we'd finally be able to get some answers to questions that have been puzzling scientists and researchers all these years. We'd likely start off with the simple ones of how they fly and what they eat. Although it appears we do have limited knowledge regarding these things, I think it's safe to say if we did come to the conclusion that they never went extinct, we'd immediately invest a lot more time, money, and effort into studying these reptiles. And that would simply be to increase our knowledge of the historic looking reptile that may or may not fly and has been argued to weigh anywhere between 200 to 550 pounds. There are some researchers who genuinely believe these things weighed half a ton, but there isn't so much weight behind that theory. No pun intended. One thing is for sure, if these guys never went extinct, I certainly hope they didn't enjoy the cold winters and humid summers of Toronto, because the last thing I'd want to see first thing in the morning is a 36 foot wide, 250 pound plus bird flying overhead. Maybe they were 500 pounds, who knows? Dinosaurs, you love them, I love them, we all love them. But what about when something that people think is a dinosaur isn't really a dinosaur? Well, nothing really changes other than the classification and terminology, but I thought that was an interesting enough introduction. We've been missing these prehistoric predators for thousands of years as the world is ever changing. Would we really want to come face to face with one though? My bet is on no, but hey, why not pontificate the possibility? Hello fellow friends and philosophers, and welcome back to the most mind-bending channel on YouTube, Life's Biggest Questions. I'm your voice in the void, Keegan Hughes, and today we're going to be venturing back into the past once again to figure out what might happen if an ancient creature didn't disappear. The question is, what if the Dacosaurus didn't go extinct? Crazy, right? Well, before we dive deep into the ancient ocean water, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more bone-breaking beasts. Perfect, let's begin. So we should probably start with some basics, huh? Like what a Dacosaurus is. Its name means tearing lizard, which is pretty wicked if you ask me. How many other creatures do you know that are named after the act of pulling or ripping something to pieces or apart with force? Absolutely powerful. The name was given to the Dacosaurus by Friedrich August von Quellstedt, who is also the owner of an excellent name. Less violent in origin though. Years later it got an updated name and still sticks to this day, likely because it's super recognizable and therefore memorable. Around 2005 a new nearly complete skull fossil was discovered and it caused a ruckus in the paleontology world. New models of the skull were made and it was found to be particularly deep in shape. And the shape reminded folks of a famous fictional monster from the sea who shoots lasers and levels Japan from time to time. Yeah, you got it. Godzilla. 
Hell yeah. This beastly boy operated in the late Jurassic era all the way through to the early Cretaceous. That's some longevity. And once you hear about how it's classified, you'll understand how this is possible. The Dacosaurus was a giant aquatic crocodile measuring up to 5 meters. Wait, a crocodile? But you said it was a saurus! This is true, but it does bear some resemblance to a mosasaur, but in its blood and bones, it knows it's a croc. For whatever reason, this sea croc was only partially adapted to the watery lifestyle, though. That Godzilla dome we mentioned earlier bears resemblance to that of terrestrial dinosaurs, and its flippers were pretty clumsy, almost as if they were leg-like. Add in some immense weight close to that of a cow, and you've got a strange ancient alligator impersonator, or something like that. Thankfully, the adaptations did seem to work well enough for this salty croc. The flipper legs were complemented by a big tail ending in a fluke shape for some extra speed in the water, and at some point it's postulated that the Dacosaurus did indeed have a salt gland. Its big, serrated, laterally compressed teeth helped it take down all sorts of prey, too. These dental features make people think it often went after larger prey. The flattened profile and extra strength in the bite would have made it possible to really crunch and munch some bigger numbers, as opposed to the more needle-like teeth of some other aquatic predators. However, the clumsy limbs mentioned earlier point to a slower peak speed than most. So, in all likelihood, the Dacosaurus took down its fair share of slower fish, shellfish, and squids. And maybe if it got lucky and found some slower lads, it ate some small marine reptiles too. Ain't nothing like a mouthful of watery lizard for breakfast, am I right? Maybe I'm spending too much time trying to relate to underwater species. There are plenty of theories as to how the Dacosaurus reproduced. Some say that based on their aquatic lifestyle, they performed live births out at sea, similar to dolphins or ichthyosaurs. Others claim that they lived life like turtles and made their way to land to lay some eggs. No Dacosaurus nests have been discovered as of yet, and thus the debate continues. Live birth would line up pretty well with the survivability and adaptability of crocodiles in general. They've been around forever regardless, and everywhere too. Dacosaurus remains have been found in Europe, North America, South America, and Russia. They got around. Good for them. And before we get into my hypotheses on what would happen had they not gone extinct, there's one more piece of info that my research turned out. The Dacosaurus is quite popular among Jurassic Park fans, especially those who play the mobile game. Apparently they're quite the powerhouse, and many people are happy to see them in their regular rotation. So if you are a big Dacosaurus user online, this one goes out to you. Alright, enough facts and figures, let's get hypothetical. And when we do that, we'll get fictional. Monstrously so. That's right, back to the Godzilla title. The reason that the Dacosaurus was given a name of a monster that was made up thousands of years after it went extinct is because of discovery made recently. By 2005, we'd already had plenty of Godzilla movies. Mr. Zilla is a cultural phenomenon, an icon, a symbol. It's impossible to separate it from the monster movie culture at large, and honestly, from the dinosaur discourse too. Even with atomic breath and the ability to annihilate entire cities, lines between the fictional creature and real, discoverable dinos are often drawn. Nobody's ever seen a real live dinosaur, or in this case, ancient sea croc, so many of the illustrations and models that exist are purely based on educated guesses. Bone structures, food samples, descendants, the works. If the Dacosaurus hung around for the thousands of years required to not go extinct, our view of the prehistoric world might be a little different. Models and comparisons might change, but I think the most noticeable difference would be in the world of fictional monsters. Godzilla just couldn't be Godzilla. See, the Dacosaurus was originally named before Godzilla made its way to the big screen in 1954, and if it never went extinct, well, we wouldn't have had to discover it through fossils. Somebody would have seen it, named it, killed it, dissected it, wrote a book on it, and more. And that deep skull that earned it the Godzilla moniker in 2005 would be a more widely known feature. Therefore, I believe if someone wanted to make Godzilla in a world where the Dacosaurus was alive and well, the design and naming scheme would have changed. I don't know if I can come up with something as snappy and legendary as Gojira itself, but hey, somebody would. And then there would be the ripple effect, radiating outwards from the newly retooled King of Monsters. Mothra, Ghidra, Ultraman, Super Sentai, all the way down to Cloverfield. All these iconic figures spawned from giant monster lore would be forever changed. There is no way that once Godzilla changed, they would just emerge the same as they did in our Dacosaurus timeline, butterfly effect and whatnot. Other than that, I think the world would be more or less the same if the Dacosaurus didn't go extinct. I mean, we'd have an answer to whether or not it laid eggs, and there'd be another crocodile out there to eat unattended toddlers. Floridians would just fry it up like popcorn chicken. Those folks love eating big old creatures. Is everyone sitting at home looking for more nightmare fuel to make it hard to go to sleep at night? Do you want some creatures stirring around in your mind that are much more deadly and larger than most of the beasts we have walking around today? Did you know that Australia used to have even more dangerous animals on it? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you are in the right place. This is Life's Biggest Questions, and here we like to take some of the most out 
outlandish ideas and ask the world what it might look like if they were real. I mean, who hasn't played this game with their friends? This is a game as old as time. Well, I'm your host, Che Dorena, and on today's Life's Biggest Questions, we are gonna be looking at what the world might look like if Megalania didn't go extinct. Well, let's start off with a little bit of a breakdown of what Megalania is. I don't expect everyone watching this video to have a detailed knowledge of all prehistoric creatures. Basically, this thing is the oldest known living monitor lizard. These are some massive lizards that we see walking around today. You know, like the Komodo dragon, the big drooling monstrosity that has a type of venom in its jaws. It can bite you and you'll slowly die over the course of three days. Jesus, that sounds like it came right out of a monster movie. So now that we have a general idea of what this creature looks like, it's a big scary lizard with some massive teeth in its head, but just how big is it? Well, there's a lot of debate on this topic. Like a lot of fossils, it can be hard to determine the exact size of these creatures because it can be hard to find a complete set of fossils. So I will give you a range. Some people think this lizard could have been around three meters long. That's around 10 feet. That's a massive lizard. It would take down Shaq for a snack and it wouldn't even look bloated after it ate him. But other people think that this beast could have been 11 meters long. That's insane. Are you serious? For anyone who uses the Imperial system, that clocks in at around 36 feet from head to tail. Just so you guys have a visual, that's about as tall as a telephone pole. And because I like to take things to the extreme on this channel, we're gonna say that this thing is as big as the larger number. Now, what did Megalania feed on? Well, back then, animals were much bigger, so it probably had a diet very close to the diet it has now. Hunting down and killing large mammals, or using a classic vulture technique of finding something that is already dead and chowing down. Why go after an animal that can run away when there's perfectly good rotting flesh waiting for you in the sun? I heard the maggots give it an extra kick. It's also thought that Megalania had venom similar to the one that is present in the Komodo dragon. That is terrifying. You have a beast that is as big as a semi-trailer, and it also has jaws that are full of a poisonous toxin. Even though we're in quarantine right now, remember, it could have been much worse. You could have been alive when Megalania was walking around, ripping cows in half with just a look. Now, how does this venom work? Well, for a long time, scientists thought that there was no venom in a Komodo dragon. That it was just the fact that the Komodo dragon had so much bacteria in its mouth from eating rotting flesh and just being an all-around dirty dude that they would bite an animal, the bite would get infected, and the animal would die over the course of three days from the infection. During this time, the Komodo dragon would follow it and wait patiently for the prey to collapse. But it turns out that the Komodo dragon actually does have venom. That venom is a hemotoxin, which stops the animal's blood from clotting. So the Komodo dragon will bite viciously onto this creature, tear open a hole, and it will bleed out. And Megalania had the ability to do the exact same thing. So what would it look like if this creature never went extinct? I mean, some people are probably watching this video and thinking that the world would be a very scary place. These things are almost like dinosaurs walking around. They would be terrorizing everyone and we would be in a constant battle with them. But personally, I don't think that would be the case. Just like every other predator on the planet, we would most likely dominate them. These ones would maybe take a little bit more technology and a lot more elbow grease, but so far nothing has been able to stand up to the human race and I don't think that these creatures would be any different. I'm confident in saying we would be able to control these beasts because there are some people who believe we might have been the ones who killed them off originally. After the discovery was made that Megalania lived as recently as 50,000 years ago, meaning that there would have been some crossover with humans and Megalania, which sounds like it would have been the worst time to be alive, but not for us, for Megalania, some people speculate that this creature went extinct because of us. It was big and threatening and a lot of food, and humans back then were very handy at grouping up and killing things. Who am I kidding? We're very handy at doing that right now. So if these things existed now, there would most likely be a few walking around in the wild, but there would be for sure some in cages, which brings me to the Tiger King theory. If Megalani was still alive right now, there would be a good chance that the documentary Tiger King would have been about a whole different group of people who collect a whole different kind of animal. If Megalania was real, we would see super rich people who own massive plots of land just so they could have one of these things walking around in their backyard. Just like the Tiger King, there would be a massive underground world of people who buy, sell, and trade Megalania. People would take pictures with these massive monsters, they would ride them, they would breed them. The market would be huge and most likely very illegal. My guess is that the people involved would be some of the wealthiest in the world. That's simply because these things would be so much harder to keep as pets. They'd be extremely expensive. Forget how much it costs to feed a tiger. These things would probably eat eight tigers a day just to keep going. It would be superstars, famous athletes, and billionaires who get into the Megalania game. Jeff Bezos would have six of these things and each one would be in a different color. The eggs alone would be worth millions of dollars and they would probably be the size of a teenager.
teenager. This means we could see a breakout situation like in Jurassic Park, but with them already running around the world, I don't think it would be too hard to contain that situation if it happened. I would imagine with this creature's size and age that it would most likely be endangered. It would be a struggle for it to find enough food because of its size. And like most other endangered animals, it would most likely be poached. That would be another element to the criminal world surrounding these creatures. Something that seems so deadly would now become a trophy for people to fluff their egos. Whenever there's something big and bad in the world, humans want to master it in every way. It doesn't matter if it's sharks, tigers, rhinos, or anything else, people will want to kill it. Black market trade for Megalania teeth, skin, bones, genitals, and eggs would be crazy. People would make crazy dishes out of all the parts of its bodies, the same way we have shark fin soup. Other people would use the teeth in the way we use rhino horn. Maybe it would be an aphrodisiac or something to give eternal life. All of these would be fake, but people would buy into it. I know that the whole outlook is very bleak, but it's most likely true. For some reason, whenever humans find a big scary creature, they want to own it in every way possible, and I don't think our ancient Komodo dragon friend would be any different. This massive predator who ran the show would now be a commodity to be traded, consumed, and gawked at. On the bright side, this might open the door to scientific communities. Having a beast around that is over a million years old and still walking the earth could unlock so many doors to our planet's history. Maybe through the DNA of this ancient creature, we could develop a whole bunch of new medicines and understand our own genome to a greater level. Maybe we would be able to find a place for these massive reptiles to live in peace and outside of our influence. Oh, and I forgot to mention that these beasts probably would only be in Australia, unless someone snuck one out into another part of the world, which I guess they could do if they had the money, but the bulk of them would be stuck on that continent because that is where they originated from. So that would mean that Australia would have even more terrifying creatures walking around it. Oh god, I would hate to be a kangaroo in the timeline where Megalania was still alive. There would be nowhere you could go to hop and stay safe. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Life's Biggest Questions. I'll be your host for this one, Jared Bronstein, and today we're talking about the giant ground sloth, which is scientifically known as the Megatherium. These guys are known to belong to the sloth, anteater, and armadillo family, and it's believed they went extinct as little as 10,000 years ago, possibly even 4,000 years ago. Before we tell you the shocking reason why they went extinct and how they would affect modern day life as we know it, make sure to subscribe, click that bell, and of course, stick around until the end for some comment replies. Hey guys, before we get into this one, I gotta give a shout out to Raid Shadow Legends. It's the only mobile game I'm willing to play and it's literally taken over. They have almost 15 million downloads in the last six months, but I'm sure that number will double in the next three months. Now, if you guys have been living under a rock and haven't heard about Raid, it's an epic dark fantasy done right. There's over 400 champions you can collect and personally customize. My favorite parts of the game is the fact that I could raid with friends in a clan. Raid also has PvP Arena where you could show off your skills. Of course, a million plus championship builds and a fully voiced story campaign, just to name a few. But best of all, it's free to play. Some extra cool features in the game are the multi-battle auto mode, where you can auto battle while you do other things. Focus on the fun stuff, not the grinding. Weekly tournaments and events where you can win extra prizes every week. From arena fighting to special dungeons, it covers all bases. There's also the new cool fusion event for Halloween, and you can get the legendary champion Harvest Jack. They've also added a ton of new champions, like Miscreated Monster and Madame Ceres. So why wait any longer? Go to the video description, click on the special links, and you will get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. Good luck and I'll see you there. So the giant ground sloth, they were big. As we know, most sloths nowadays are quite small. We're talking maybe three feet, give or take. About the size of a medium dog. Their ancestors, however, the giant ground sloth, well, they were much, much bigger. And if the name itself isn't a dead giveaway to their size, it's believed they were as big as 13 feet tall and four tons and walked on their hind legs. Now, some compare their size and weight to that of a modern day elephant. And unlike the modern day sloth, which can usually be seen hanging out in a tree, these guys lived on the ground. They too had massive claws and seemed to move quite slowly. Another similarity between the modern day sloth and the giant ground sloth is their diet. Although the giant ground sloth was very capable of slashing up a defenseless animal, it seems their diet mainly consisted of leaves, grass, and although there have been claims that it could have been carnivorous, that theory seems to still be argued to this day. This theory derives from the fact that their teeth seem to have been triangular with a sharp edge to them. There's also the argument that the part of the animal's elbow that the tricep muscles attached to was quite short, which is frequently seen in carnivores to optimize speed over over strength. However, this claim seems to have been disproven because these giant animals lacked carnassial teeth, which carnivorous predators are known to have. Aside from this, upon retrieving the giant sloth's manure, which has been found in various caves, there were no animal bones. This has led many researchers to call the idea that they were in fact carnivores to be unrealistic. 
So now that we know they mostly ate plants, although they were easily capable of clawing something up or even flipping it on its back and taking bites out of it whole, where were these things known to live? Originally they roamed the lands which we now call South America. They liked wood and grasslands. But the most recent fossil discoveries, they've been found mostly in caves in North America. It's believed they inhabited South America around 35 million years ago and then migrated to North America somewhat 8 million years ago. But some research believes these things lived in North America as recently as 11,000 years ago, in South America 10,500 years ago, and some on the West Indian Islands about 4,400 years ago. Most were believed to roll around in packs, but some seem to live in caves alone. And the real reason for their extinction? Not the Ice Age, like most prehistoric animals. It's believed humans actually hunted and killed them off. Although the Ice Age of course did a lot of the work from what was left, it's strongly believed humans hunted these things most likely for meals. The types of plants the giant ground sloth lived off of are still plentiful in today's day and age. Which crosses out the notion that they died to a lack of food supply. Of course, as we do more research on these guys, we'll find more information out about them. But given the information we do know now, how would their presence affect our modern day society? If the giant ground sloth lived in the same areas it's believed to have inhabited 10,000 years ago, they would most likely live in the grasslands in South America, more specifically parts of Argentina, western Venezuela, and northeastern Colombia. They could also live in the south of the Guavia River, Amazon River Basin, and Orinoco River. In North America, it's quite possible these things could live in northwestern Canada, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and in caves in the likes of Missouri, Minnesota, Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, where their fossils or manure has been found. But having these things live in the wild wouldn't be such a danger to humans, physically of course. Their presence would certainly attract hunters, who would want to sell their fur, claws, teeth, and who knows what else. As previously mentioned, humans are believed to be a big reason these guys went extinct. They were slow and big, so a large, slow moving target wouldn't be much trouble for a hunter with a far ranged weapon, such as a bow, or in today's day and age, a gun. But if we had packs of these beasts traveling around eating the leaves and fruits of our trees, that may have an impact on the entire ecosystem in these grasslands. As we know, less food for other animals could lead to extinction of some animals and overpopulation of other animals, or insects. Given their size, these things most likely had quite an appetite. But they wouldn't necessarily eat all the time. It took them a while to digest their food, which is why it's believed they would sit in caves. A form of protection, but also a good place to just sit and let your food digest. Of course, given their size, other animals may try to take them down as a form of food for the family. An example could be a group of hyenas. If a pack were able to surround a single giant ground sloth, they would definitely have a good chance of turning it into a feast. But on the other side, the giant ground sloth may turn into a carnivorous animal after defending itself. If the animal is already dead and in front of you, why not give it a try? However, it may not be as black and white as that. It's safe to say the giant ground sloth has had to defend itself previously. And just because it killed another animal, it may not eat it because it already knows what it likes and doesn't like. So again, this leads me to believe it wouldn't be much of a threat to humans. They wouldn't come into our city and attack us. But their presence would certainly throw off the entire ecosystem. And farmers may see some of their crops being eaten by the wild giant ground sloth that happens to stroll through the village or town. Deers, rabbits, armadillos, among other animals whose diet mainly consists of plants and herbs, would see a decrease in food. This could cause their populations to decrease as well. Now to us, this may not be seen as such a big deal. What do we need wild deer or rabbits for? Well, when you put it that way, you're right. We don't use them as part of our everyday routine. But the way the ecosystem currently is allows us to live the way we do. Even the slightest change in the way things are currently going have a ripple effect from top to bottom. With the decline of one or many populations of species comes an increase of their prey. This could lead to more disease among other probable causes. So all in all, to summarize, if the giant ground sloth didn't go extinct, it would mainly just affect those animals currently living in the grasslands of South and North America. At first, the human race wouldn't see much of a difference in our day to day lives. But over time, we would definitely see some changes. The presence of them would specifically affect farmers, and that in turn would affect those who buy local meats or produce. The change in the ecosystem would send a shockwave across the board. Depending on how it affects you personally would really depend on where you live, your diet, and which animals or produce you tend to consume. But like a handful of our videos, this isn't of any real concern. The giant ground sloth is long gone. Well, only about 10,000 years, or possibly 4,500 years or so, but still, not a concern of ours. For now, we can just enjoy the company of their distant relatives, the two and three toed sloths, who just hang from trees and look like they're always stoned. Hello my friends, welcome back to LBQ. I'll be your host, Jared Bronstein. And before we swing into it, make sure you guys are subscribed, do me a solid and click that bell, and most importantly, drop us some comments down below with other videos you'd like to see on this channel. We take all your suggestions into consideration when deciding to make our videos, so please don't get discouraged and be assured your input is being considered. I'm gonna be responding to some comments from another video at the end of this one as well, so if you guys don't have a question, at the very least, drop me a funny or a fun comment that I can respond to in another video. 
Today we'll be answering the question, what if the Gigantopithecus didn't go extinct? Some refer to these creatures as our real life King Kong, while others claim it's what Bigfoot looks like. Either way, we're going to be jumping into this one and answering how the Gigantopithecus would affect our world and society if it were to rule the jungle today. Now it's believed chimpanzees have the strength anywhere between 5 to 8 times that of a human. There's no denying apes in general, gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans are incredibly strong. With that being said, to date, one of the strongest chimpanzees that's been in captivity was named Boma. In 1926, Boma pulled 847 pounds using just his right hand. Boma was just 165 pounds himself. Another instance proving chimp's true strength is when a former circus chimp, Suzette, made a pull of 1,258 pounds. It's believed she pulled almost 10 times her weight, meaning she most likely weighed around 125 pounds, maybe a bit more, so we could say up to 150 pounds. So what would that mean in regards to the strength of the Gigantopithecus? Well, they were believed to be approximately 9 to 10 feet tall and weigh around 1,200 pounds. Assuming they too could pull up to 10 times their weight, these beasts would be capable of pulling things weighing over 12,000 pounds. In other words, they'd be one of the strongest animals known to man. But strength aside, their height would also give them an incredible advantage over the likes of gorillas, who can allegedly carry things up to 4,400 pounds. The difference is gorillas are usually 5 feet tall. So these things would be almost three times as strong and tall as a gorilla. Although King Kong was written to be over 100 feet tall, the Gigantopithecus really would be the modern day Kong, although Bigfoot would most likely be a better comparison. So now that we got the stats, let's talk about how this beast roaming the land would affect us. As always, it really depends where you live. I feel like I say that in every video, but it's true. In today's society, these things would be living in the likes of India, Vietnam, China, and Indonesia. Meaning, if you lived in North or South America, you probably wouldn't be affected too much. The Middle East and any country in Africa probably wouldn't be affected either. But how would these beasts roaming the grassy lands of India, Vietnam, China, and Indonesia change the way things currently are? For starters, what would these things eat? Tigers? Buffalo? and be rhinos? Think again. Based off of the teeth found belonging to these species, there's a widespread belief they ate a lot of bamboo. Although they had incredibly strong teeth and jaws, a large majority were found to have cavities. It seems they would have the same diet as the giant panda. There's also the possibility that these monstrosities ate fruits when bamboo was unavailable. I know, I'm just as surprised as you guys. I thought these things would run the show, but apparently they aren't carnivores. But this also could have been because they were roaming the earth back when the likes of the Colombian mammoth, the cave hyena, and the short-faced bear, which was about 12 feet tall, roamed the earth. Not to say these chimps couldn't hold their own, but if they were hanging out in trees, why go fight for food when it's literally in your home? Nowadays, however, things will most likely be very different. With the likes of leopards and snakes living in the trees, I have no doubt these monsters would make a meal of them. Whether or not they enjoyed it would be an entirely different question, but if a leopard is attacking one of these things, you can be sure it wouldn't be much of a fight. Spoiler alert, I don't think the leopard would win. Now assuming they stuck to their diet and only ate meat when they were defending themselves, the Gigantopithecus may drive the giant panda to extinction. Clearly between the two, the giant panda would be seen as a victim if there was an altercation over bamboo for example. As of now, the giant panda is no longer an endangered species as it once was. However, this would most likely change, assuming not only their food supply slowly diminished, but making it nearly impossible for them to get food if it meant going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Gigantopithecus. Like most forest animals, I don't think the countries would have to worry about these animals roaming the streets. Especially considering how they hang out in the trees, they wouldn't want to wander into the city streets. But when it came to tourism, or camping, or even indigenous tribes living out in the wild, there may be some issues. Anyone who were to get close to these animals could be seen as a threat, and although tour guides, for example, are well equipped with tranquilizers and such to help protect those in case of a confrontational situation, these beasts would change the game. A regular tranquilizer would not be strong enough to take this thing down, nor would two or three, meaning research would need to be done to figure out not only how to control these things in regards to their behavior and how aggressive they are towards humans, but how they could possibly affect the ecosystem in general. Due to their large size, they were believed to consume a lot of food. The reason they went extinct? Loss of food supply and not being able to adapt to rising temperatures. As we know, the temperature keeps rising, which would be seen as an issue for these guys. This could lead to the animals constantly moving to find new appropriate habitats that can sustain them. Unfortunately, even if they didn't go extinct about 100,000 plus years ago, there's a very real possibility they would go extinct in today's day and age based on climate change alone. Now thankfully, this is a big old what if. These things are long, long gone, and we're still finding their fossils over 100,000 years later. As we find out more information on these beasts, we'll have a better understanding of their habits and behaviors. Until then, we get to keep making fun hypothetical videos like this one, which makes my job quite fun.